The ESF and the CIA go wild fighting the Cold War. To learn about the history of the CIA, I recommend Legacy of Ashes, a book by New York Times reporter Tim Weiner. Weiner has been working on Legacy of Ashes for 20 years. He has read over 50,000 government documents, 2,000 oral histories, and has conducted 300 on-the-record interviews. This is as factual as you can get. Weiner has also won a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of the intelligence community. Despite the vast resources at its disposal, the CIA has largely been a failure. First, it is no good at espionage. In a typical example, the agency dropped millions of dollars worth of gold bars, arms, two-way radios, and agents into Poland to support a powerful Polish underground movement that didn't exist. Five years of planning, various agents, and millions of dollars down the drain. On the clandestine side, the human costs were far higher. The CIA has secretly supported fascists, militarists, murderers, death squads, and religious fanatics. The agency's official history could be written in blood, not ink. In Iran, the CIA coup initiated a period of 25 years of repression and torture. In Guatemala, a CIA-organized coup initiated 40 years of military government death squads, torture, disappearances, and mass executions. In Indonesia, it waged a full-scale war against the government, including bombing runs by American pilots. In Laos, the CIA was repeatedly involved in coups and created a clandestine army to overthrow the government. In Ecuador, the CIA ousted President Velasco. In Congo, the CIA installed Mobutu Seko, who ruled with a level of corruption and cruelty that shocked even his CIA handlers. The list goes on. Because the agency operates in secret, most Americans are unaware of the crimes being perpetrated in their names. The deaths from these armed assaults run into the millions. To learn more about this dark history, go to Google Archive News. There has been nothing, no matter how terrible, that the ESF has not been willing to finance. There is unfortunately one area the agency excelled. Through the CIA, the ESF has decades of experience with undermining democracy. In Japan, for example, the CIA entrenched the Liberal Democratic Party in power and turned Japan into a single-party state, which it remains to this day. The other thing the CIA was good at was hiding its own incompetence. Even when the CIA seemed to fail at everything it undertook, the ability to represent failure as success was becoming a CIA tradition. The ESF-CIA set up a worldwide propaganda network. The U.S. engaged in a propaganda war against the Soviet Union. And so it built a worldwide propaganda network, which ranged in importance from Radio Free Europe to his third-string guy in Quito. The network was known to those inside the CIA as Weisner's Wurlitzer, named after Frank Weisner and the Wurlitzer organ. Almost at the push of a button, the Wurlitzer became the means for orchestrating in almost any language anywhere in the world whatever tune the CIA was in the mood to hear. The agency's long-standing relationship with American journalists was first called to public attention in 1973. That led to investigations by two congressional committees. Let's look at the final report of one of those committees. What interests us is part 10 on the domestic impact of CIA operations. The variety of CIA relationships with the U.S. media makes a systematic breakdown almost impossible. The CIA is now using several hundred American academics who write books and other materials for propaganda purposes. In the world of covert propaganda, book publishing activities have a special place. A single book can significantly change the reader's attitude and actions to an extent unmatched by the impact of any other single medium. Well over a thousand books were produced, subsidized, or sponsored. I have a particular hatred for the book form of propaganda. If anyone thinks the financial crisis was caused by Wall Street greed, please watch my video on the true cause of the crisis. The danger of CIA propaganda contaminating U.S. media occurs in virtually any instance of propaganda use. In the case of books, substantial fallout in the United States may be a necessary part of the propaganda process. An American that reads one of these books would not know that his thoughts and opinions are being shaped by an agency of the United States government. The CIA failed to reveal the names of propaganda books published since 1967. In fact, the CIA wasn't cooperative in anything with regard to its media relationships. Carl Bernstein from the Watergate scandal explained why in his cover story published in 1977. Because from the CIA's point of view, this was the highest and most sensitive covert program of all, the CIA went to extraordinary lengths to hide its media relationships. 
the CIA persuaded the committee to restrict its inquiry and to deliberately misrepresent the actual scope of the activities in its final report. Obscuring the facts was simple. No mention was made of the 400 summaries. Instead, the report noted blandly that some 50 recent contacts with journalists had been studied, thus conveying the impression that the agencies dealing with the press had been limited to those instances. Even while the Senate Intelligence Committee was holding its hearings, the CIA continued to maintain ties with 75 to 90 journalists of every description. As Bernstein discovered after six months of research, more than 400 American journalists have secretly carried out assignments for the CIA. Some of the journalists were Pulitzer Prize winners, distinct reporters. To a degree never widely suspected, the CIA has concentrated its relationships with journalists in the most prominent sectors of the American press corps. In other words, the big names in news. That means people like Brian William and Katie Couric. Go to my entry on the nightly news for an example on how bad the situation is. In response to Bernstein's article, the New York Times wrote a three-part series on the CIA's propaganda network, and that was the last we ever heard of the issue. Some interesting things were written in this series. At least 18 American reporters have refused CIA offers, some of which were quite lucrative. At least 22 American news organizations have employed American journalists who were working for the CIA. These include some of the most influential news organizations in America. Major outlets like Time, Newsweek, Week, CBC News, and The Times itself were the most extensively used. The Times unearthed several occasions where the CIA had interfered with the paper's reporting, including in 1954, when the CIA overthrew the government of Mexico, and a Times reporter was getting too close to discovering its role. The New York Times also shows how the CIA suppresses undesired information. The CIA seriously considered a plan to buy up the entire first printing of a book to keep it from the public view. When that didn't work, a proper a propaganda campaign was initiated to encourage reviewers to denigrate the book. A large part of the CIA's effort at domestic censorship was aimed at news accounts of its own operations. Finally, take a look at the CIA report on openness from 1992, which shows that the Wurlitzer is alive and well. The CIA's Public Affairs Office now has relationships with reporters from every major newswire service, newspaper, newsweekly, and television network in the nation. In many instances, the CIA has persuaded reporters to postpone, change, hold, or even scrap stories. This has helped the agency change some intelligence failure stories into intelligence success stories. The ESF's twisted logic. Consider this. First, the Fed has established currency swaps on the ESF's behalf. Swaps are a type of derivative. Second, the ESF intervenes mainly in the forward market through the New York Fed. Forwards are also derivatives. Now, on the New York Fed's website, it states, The Fed historically has not engaged in forward or other derivative transactions. This lie is produced by the ESF's twisted logic. You see, anything the Fed does on the ESF's behalf doesn't officially happen. This same logic applies to other agencies. For example, the CIA doesn't need to tell Congress about anything funded directly by the ESF. Now take this twisted logic in the context of journalists paid by the CIA. In 1976, CIA announced it would no longer enter into paid relationships with journalists. But what about the ESF? Well, in 1971, the ESF had 300 people on a payroll of 5 million. And in 1976, the ESF had 500 people on a payroll of 10 million. That's quite a big jump, isn't it? This propaganda network has always been financed by the ESF. Taking the CIA out of the equation doesn't change much. The ESF spends the entire U.S. gold reserves. What happens when you give people who believe they have a self-appointed mission of world-shaking importance all control over U.S. gold reserves? Well, they knew the answer to this question back in 1939. Senator Glass, a critic of the ESF, explains what the government would do. You would just go ahead and spend that money and then borrow more on top of it. To demonstrate what would happen to the dollar, he held up a bundle of German marks. You have to understand that owning gold was only illegal for Americans. Foreigners were not prohibited prohibited from asking for, receiving, and owning gold instead of holding on to dollars. So when the ESF delivered suitcases filled with cash to foreign politicians, it was spending America's gold. This was a big deal. Because the supply of gold is limited, its value is steady over long periods of time. On the other hand, the supply of paper currencies, like the dollar, is not limited, so they lose value against gold, or crash completely. 
By 1956, America's gold hoard was too small to back the dollar. The ESF was spending money as though the sky was the limit. Using the IMF and the World Bank, the ESF went wild financing CIA Cold War activity. This massive spending turned the balance of payments negative. These deficits were badly damaging the dollar. Other countries were building up claims against U.S. gold. The outcome of the ESF's foreign aid was obvious. By 1960, the U.S. gold supply was down to 18 billion against 19 billion in foreign claims. The United States was essentially broke. The gold outflow begins. The gold outflow began in 1958. America's foreign aid and military security programs started the gold trickling outwards. It swelled to almost torrential proportions in 1960. The situation had begun to cause panic. Confidence in the greenback was failing. The dollar, the U.S. economy, and the world monetary system were in danger of collapsing. This was a problem. You see, on the day the dollar crashes, the entire world will focus on the agency that was supposed to protect its value. How do you think Americans, with their retirement savings wiped out, living through the Second Great Depression, would feel about Project Artichoke, a 15-year, multi-billion dollar search for ways to control the human mind? I think the American people would be quite angry about how the ESF wasted the U.S.'s monetary wealth, and a lot of people would end up in jail for a very long time. So people at the Treasury started defending the dollar like their lives depended on it, because they did. Most scandals start small, and the perpetrators dig themselves deeper and deeper. The ESF had no hope of ever replacing the enormous quantity of money it had spent. But instead of facing this harsh reality, it tried to delay the day of reckoning. The ESF's desperate dollar defense. The steady drain on U.S. gold holdings was a threat to the ESF, because if it led to dollar devaluation and economic depression, the entire world would have focused on the confidential accounts of the Exchange Stabilization Fund and the activity it was financing. This also meant defending the Bretton Woods Agreement, because any major reform of the Bretton Woods system, especially the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, would have also exposed the ESF's activities. The ESF needed to do whatever it took to defend the world's monetary system, and the American dollar had to be propped up, even at the cost of begging. This is how the dollar's defense began. Currency interventions to prop up the dollar. In 1961, the ESF began intervening in the foreign exchange market. However, there were some problems. By 1962, the ESF had committed much of its resources through the provision of foreign aid, wasting them funding covert operations. The IMF was also drained of most of its golden dollars. Remember that the ESF's desperate dollar defense is to hide this fact to begin with. Anyhow, the Federal Reserve System's resources were quickly recruited to supplement the dollar's defense, and the Fed gave up whatever was left of its independence without much of a fight. Unfortunately for the ESF, it had another problem. The way central banks defend their currencies is by selling off their foreign reserves, and the ESF did not have any foreign currencies on hand, so the Treasury used a variety of strategies to come up with the foreign currencies it needed. It got West Germany to prepay its World War II debt. The Treasury also borrowed to get the money it needed, using a series of special Treasury bond sales to foreign governments. These were called Rosa bonds. They were denominated in foreign currencies and were part of America's national debt. The ESF also entered into a network of swap agreements with other central banks. Currency swaps are a derivative instrument that allow irresponsible central banks to temporarily prop up their currencies by racking up large amounts of foreign debt. The ESF used these swaps because they hid what it was doing. For example, it doesn't look like the US is borrowing anything here, does it? Still another way the ESF got foreign currencies was by using the IMF. The IMF was a great help in defending the dollar. However, explaining how these IMF loans work is complicated, but it adds up to this. More foreign denominated debt hidden from the American people. Through all these different types of arrangements, the United States armed itself with the hundreds of billions of dollars worth of major foreign currencies it needed to defend the dollar. Gambling in derivative markets. Because so much of its resources were tied up, the ESF intervened mainly in the forwards market. Despite all its stratagems to come up with foreign currencies, the Treasury simply didn't have enough to defend the dollar. So it sold foreign currencies it didn't yet have through forward transactions. By promising to sell these currencies in the future, the Treasury 
encouraged individuals to hold dollar-denominated assets. When the dollar for future delivery sells at a substantial discount, it implies that holders have doubts about its value, and weakness in the dollar may induce foreigners to move their money elsewhere. So every time a foreign currency traded at a premium to the dollar, the ESF entered into millions worth of forward contracts. All these forward commitments carried the risk of loss if the dollar did not appreciate. For example, when the treasury was selling all these forward marks, it was gambling that the price of the mark would drift lower, and the ESF eventually lost big time on its forward bets. Forwards are also a type of derivative, the same complicated financial bets that have fueled the mess over the last few years. And 50 years ago, long before Wall Street even knew what they were, the ESF was dealing in massive quantities of these risky bets. The London Gold Pool. Another arrangement made to bolster the world's monetary system against collapse was the London Gold Pool. Formed in late 1961, it was a device to halt the raids on gold and give the dollar the appearance of strength. The exchange stabilization fund was used to participate in the gold pool, and the U.S. supplied 59% of the gold sold in London. The United States never officially acknowledged taking part in this pool. However, this very real international gold pool kept the London free market stable temporarily during the 60s, so the ESF has a history of international conspiracy, deceiving the world. This Wall Street Journal article shows the ESF's attitude towards the truth. In this business, you have to choose between lying to people or scaring them to death. The ESF's choice is clear, to lie. This lying is squarely in the public interest. To give the world a glimpse at the raw figures for a single day's actual gold outflow could prove disastrous. Debasing statistics. The ESF is ever more shrewdly guarding the dollar's value abroad through little-known techniques that range from double-counting gold bars to tinkering with the maturities of otherwise routine government securities. The result is a web of statistics that mask almost as much as they display. Even a prominent financier who helped create the government's dollar defenses confesses that he can't tell anymore what our balance of payment trend is. The ESF had arrangements with the IMF that made the gold stock look healthier than it really was was. Only a fleeting footnote brought the ESF's double counting of gold bars to light. For ESF officials anxious to put the best face on figures, nothing is too absurd, including selling government debt with the odd maturity of one year and two days. This dishonesty was centered in the treasury at the ESF. Even the massive currency swaps the Fed has with other central banks are carefully constructed to avoid statistical injuries. Since the 1960s, the dodges have only become more artful. What if it's true? As Kevin Phillips recently stated in an article in Harper's, that ever since the 1960s, Washington has gulled its citizens and creditors by debasing official statistics, the vital instruments with which the vigor and muscle of the American economy are measured. Propaganda. Statistical nonsense was only the beginning. In defense of the dollar, the ESF unleashed the mighty Wurlitzer. Every propaganda pitch was used to promote confidence in the dollar. Whenever the value of the dollar came under question, this propaganda took over to convince us that losing money is good for us. It was in the 60s that the ESF's favorite bit of propaganda was born. The danger of deflation. Americans were told to worry less about the outflow of U.S. gold and instead worry about worldwide deflation. This was pure ESF propaganda. Deflation signifies a general decline in prices, and it hasn't happened in the United States since the ESF's creation. So right when the ESF was in the middle of this desperate dollar defense, there was a flood of articles like these warning that the dollar might magically go up in value. Two things have happened since the 1960s. The dollar has lost nearly all its value, and the articles warning about deflation have gotten louder and louder in volume. Today we've reached a point where every Wall Street economist is looking for the arrival of a great deflation. Two things to take away from this are 1. The loudness of the deflation propaganda gives a good idea of the ESF's level of control over U.S. media. 2. As long as the ESF is in charge of defending the dollar, the chance of any real deflation is nil.
Corrupting Economics Classic economics teaches that government deficit spending leads to inflation. This was the dominant view before the 1960s. Heavy deficits made for inflation. Heavy government spending ruins the dollar. This fundamental truth was acknowledged by everyone, and it was a threat to the ESF. You see, in the 60s, when the ESF was spreading deflation propaganda and doing everything in its power to boost confidence in the dollar, articles like this one appeared in the press. If we are safe in all this spending, what are we waiting for? Why don't we double the national debt and everyone gets rich? Anyone can promise to speed up the printing presses. Does this bring happiness and security? We all grow progressively poorer as the dollar's value declines, and declining currencies follow the law of physical <coughs> bodies. They accelerate as they fall. It should be obvious why the US Treasury did not like classic economics. As part of its dollar defense, the ESF used its network of American academics to promote a new set of rules for managing the economy. This new theory of fiscal management called for planned treasury deficits to lead America to prosperity on a permanent basis and make recessions obsolete. It was called Keynesian economics, and the 1960s were a pivotal decade in the shift from classic to Keynesian economics. Of course, this Keynesian economics was nonsense. The reality is that governments that overspend face global and epidemical forces from the outside that no amount of mystic theory can avoid or kick down into the deep freeze. When anybody proposes cradle-to-the-grave disbursements by the U.S. Treasury that somehow sound free, our misinformation becomes complete. The Academy Award-winning 2010 documentary, Inside Job, shows how the study of economics has been completely corrupted. The financial industry also exerts its influence in a more subtle way, one that most Americans don't know about. It has corrupted the study of economics itself. Arm-twisting pro-U.S. governments. By 1960, the world was filled with pro-U.S. states as a result of the CIA's actions. Although this was done initially simply to fight the Cold War, the ESF turned to these countries for support in defending the dollar. You see, foreign purchases of U.S. securities weren't left entirely to chance. Foreign governments were coaxed into investing in the dollar in the most statistically smoothing way. In other words, the ESF went back to all the fascists, militarists, and murderers it supported, and through some arm twisting, got them to help defend the dollar. The CIA installed regimes, started accumulating more dollars in their official reserves than they actually needed. The Treasury also began to pressure these pro-US states to buy weapons, since purchases of military wares helped to defend the dollar. Take Japan, for example, who was recruited to help save the dollar in 1968. Japan agreed to aid the dollar by purchasing Treasury securities and increasing its purchases of American arms. Since since then, Japan's reserves have skyrocketed, and Japan remains one of the top 10 buyers of U.S. weapons. With 70% of all sales, America now runs a global weapons monopoly. Don't think for a second that that's an accident. The IMF and World Bank seek repayment on their phony loans. The 1960s also witnessed another type of revolution, the empowerment of the World Bank and the IMF. If you remember, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were created by the ESF to help finance covert operations. Under the cover of foreign aid, they made billions of, quote, loans to fund CIA activities. Well, in the 60s, the ESF started trying to collect on all these phony loans. This is outlined in the book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. The ESF used highly paid professionals who cheated countries around the world to get the loans repaid. These economic hitmen used draconian techniques to get the IMF and World Bank their money back. Their tools for getting their way were even nastier. And when these economic hitmen failed to get leaders to comply, the jackals go in and either overthrow or assassinate these leaders. And if the jackals fail, as they did in, in, in Iraq, then they'll be sent in the military. President Kennedy disagrees with the ESF. Although the ESF had an extraordinary amount of power, there was one person that was supposed to be able to control it, the President of the United States. And when the ESF was beginning its desperate dollar defense, the President of the United States was John F. Kennedy. Now, it was no secret that the Treasury and President Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors had been engaged in a running battle over the best way to defend the dollar. 
the divisions within the American government followed habitual lines. The Treasury Department, specifically Secretary Douglas Dillon and Under Secretary Robert V. Rosa, advocated rather limited changes in international financial arrangements. It is no surprise that the Treasury resisted monetary reform. You'd expect the guy selling Rosa bonds to reject the idea of scrapping the existing system. On the other side, you had President Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors, the State Department, and the White House staff, who wanted wanted radical new international mechanism and far greater multilateral currency management. That would have been the end of Bretton Woods and the ESF-controlled monetary system. For the first two and a half years of Kennedy's presidency, the view of the Treasury prevailed. But, in the middle of 1963, JFK stopped listening to the Treasury. President Kennedy swung more closely to the views held by his Council of Economic Advisors. Monetary reform was winning support. Then, in August 1963, JFK came publicly to accept the idea that the United States had to join in the creation of a new international financial machinery. This was a radical change. Two months later in October, the President won a standing ovation for declaring that the United States will support any needed measures to increase international liquidity. Widespread support seemed to be developing for an overhaul of the world's currency system, and President Kennedy was about to expose the ESF secrets to the world, sending important people at the Treasury to jail. The same people who, through the Secret Service, were in charge of defending his life. One month later, President Kennedy died, killed by a magic bullet. And when JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy, ran for president, he died. Even JFK's son also died. The Kennedy Curse. There was one good thing stemming from the death of President Kennedy, and that's the fact that monetary reform died with him. Ambitious plans to remake the world's monetary system never got off the ground. This disappointed the State Department, the Council of Economic Advisors, and a large number of academic economists. And it was a triumph for Robert Rosa, the manager of the Treasury's ESF. Things spiral out of the ESF's control. Although the threat of monetary reform was gone, the ESF, in trying to defend the dollar, was essentially running a giant Ponzi scheme that was doomed to failure. The steady drop in U.S. gold defied all attempts to plug the drain, and by 1967 the United States was at the brink of a fiscal crisis. The London Gold Pool failed in 1968 in the face of the largest gold rush in history. Buyers throughout Europe demanded gold, and mob scenes erupted as the price soared. Many refused to accept U.S. dollars dollars as payment. Gold stocks were cleaned out virtually overnight. The trading in gold was colossal. The rush was on because speculators had become convinced that the U.S. was nearing the end of its gold tether. Having tasted blood and scenting the kill, they ripped and clawed the remaining gold stocks from the gold pool. The whole international monetary system was collapsing. With the Treasury controlling its actions, confidence in the Fed collapsed. The Fed became a joke. The Federal Reserve hurls thunderbolts and nothing happens. It tells the world solemnly that, by golly, it means business in stopping inflation, but it doesn't know how. U.S. deficits spiraled out of control, and the more money these deficits created, the more severe the inflation. The law of supply and demand made this inevitable. Declining currencies excel right as they fall, and the dollar was crashing against gold, and consumer prices were soaring parabolically. The ESF's Rosa bonds and Ford transactions created losses as the dollar depreciated. The ESF soon registered a negative capital position. It was technically bankrupt. A sense of fear of the unknown was being transmitted by the normally cool operators of the New York Fed. Not only was the dollar falling against stronger currencies, but also weaker ones. There was a sense of panic. In newspapers, the Treasury was being openly ridiculed. Then, in 1979, the dollar lost its biggest support. The European community was determined to avoid further inflation. And so the Treasury was told that support from Europe was gone. The vulnerability of the dollar was impossible to describe. Congress was warned that America was about to experience a holocaust of runaway inflation, a cataclysm which would make the Depression seem like a tea party. Then deficits stopped mattering. In 1981, caught in a tide of red ink, administration officials tried, somewhat implausibly, to downplay the traditional view that deficits lead to spiraling prices. Stunned audiences were told that there is no direct or indirect connection between deficits and inflation. The U.S. then ran massive deficits, and inflation went down. The link between deficits and inflation broke completely. For the record, this is the equivalent of an African shaman declaring he has mystical powers and then levitating himself in a ring of fire.
After deficits stopped mattering, the dollar soared and the ESF's profits skyrocketed. In 1980, after dumping 100,000 tons of gold onto the market in a desperate attempt to keep prices down, the Treasury halted regular gold sales. Gold prices then entered a 20-year bear market. Remember the variety of stratagems the ESF used to arm itself with foreign currencies by borrowing from abroad? Well, after 1980, this stopped being a problem. Yeah. The all-knowing, all-seeing Fed did what it had to do to kill inflation without ever stopping printing money. We were spending our way to prosperity, enjoying the best economy in years, low unemployment, high profits, trivial inflation, all fueled by our willingness to go deeply into debt in the cause of immediate gratification. It was called disinflation, and it was here to stay. Sure, the majority of financial experts had been expecting a wave of inflation, a rerun of the 1970s only worse, but things didn't work out that way. Thanks to the magic of disinflation, as for questions like, why did interest rates enter a 30-year downward trend, or how the hell does this disinflation thing work? Well, they remain unanswered.